What's up, everybody? So, do you guys love editing photos? Do you hate it? What program do you use, by the way? Are you guys Lightroom, Creative Cloud, CC users? Do you use Lightroom Online? The Lightroom Online version? Maybe you're a Capture One user. Maybe you use Capture One. Whatever program you use, today it is all about workflow. And we're diving specifically into Lightroom because that's what we're using, but expect a deep dive like this on Capture One soon because I am thinking about changing to Capture One. Let's go. By the way, welcome Turtle, welcome Julie, welcome Casper. Everybody else who's watching, don't be afraid to say hi. The whole point about live streams is the interaction. So please say hello, say hello to each other. Welcome. You'll also see your chat messages showing up up there on the screen. By the way, guys, I will be processing some images today. I will be reviewing some images today. If you have images that you'd like to be reviewed, you need to join the Discord. How you join my Discord is simply by looking in the description of the video that you're watching, or you can look in chat right now while you're live and you'll see the Discord link magically appear. All right, I'll be asking you guys lots of questions today. So please, today is an interactive stream. I want you guys to be answering in chat the stuff that I ask you, because again, I'm trying to make content for you. And the more questions I ask, the more I understand where you are, what struggles you're having with your processing, with Lightroom, with getting the most out of your photos. So the more questions you ask, the more I'm able to target that specific question and help you specifically. All right. So um, it's important to have a workflow that works for you, a workflow that's streamlined so you can achieve consistent results. So today we are talking all about post-production and we're going to go through my specific workflow, what I do when I'm working on my photos because we're all different. We all use the programs, the tools that we have available to us a little bit differently. So today we're going to talk about what I do. I'm going to be going over every kind of step and I'll be asking you questions along the way. Let's get into it. Let's get into it. All right. So let me get into Lightroom. I've selected some photos to process. I'm going to show you quite a few different angles that I go about it. The first thing we're going to talk about specifically is importing. Now, I don't have a memory card set to import right now, but I do have the window open. And on import, the thing that I think is important is that you use the file handling menu to make specific selections on building smart previews. I make sure that I don't import duplicates. It's sometimes we actually find ourselves uh, importing the same files twice. It's really easy to get our files super messy. Another thing that I do, which many people don't do, is rename their files. I rename my files on import. You can also add the date that your images were shot here quite automatically. For me, I just name my subject and the folder that my folders are stored in have the date. I don't use subfolder, which is very critical. I don't use subfolders because I don't want to bury my pictures inside of inside a folder, inside a folder, inside a folder, which subfolders has a tendency to do. And another thing is the application during import, apply during import. I always apply my lens corrections for whatever lens I'm shooting. I shoot Canon cameras, so I make sure that I apply my lens corrections on import. Right now, we haven't uh, imported any photos, so we don't have anything to apply lens corrections to, but that's just so you know. Um, the next major thing here is the destination, which is where your photographs go. I store all my photos on externals. You can see here I have two, I actually have three externals mounted. One, two, three. I store them in a folder called masters 
And then because they're not in subfolders, right inside the masters, you see all my photographs organized by date. All right, so that is the first simple thing on importing. The key things to remember when you're importing your photos, make sure that you are adding, um, some people even go as far as adding keywords on import. I don't add keywords on import. I have to be better at keywording my photos. We are going to be talking about keywording in a minute. The thing that's important is to rename your photos and to add your metadata, your copyright information on import. That protects you. It protects your files from being stolen and it removes the reason for you to ever watermark your final images because your images are digitally watermarked. So you don't have to watermark them because the watermark is baked into them. If you watermark this way on import, anytime one of your photographs is opened in an imaging program on the header of the photograph, it says copyright your name. So make sure you guys are adding your metadata. It takes, it's one time to fill out your metadata but filling it out one time means every time you bring your photographs in, it has that copyright information there. And I'm gonna show you right here on just any one of the photographs that I've brought in. You can see it has the title. You can see it has the date, obviously all my exposure information. It shows what camera I'm shooting with, R5 serial number, what lens and artist. It says Steve Cardi photographer. So that's the copyright information. That's what appears in all of these photographs. So it's important to use your metadata. All right, let's get into our next section, which is I'm going to select a photograph or three and show you how I bring out the best out of my photographs. And I'm going to go, I would say the smartest thing to do is to go step by step. Uh, I do have some images that I've processed before from some of my viewers. So I'm going to start with just a simple untouched. Let's make sure that this picture is, um, 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 um. Let's make sure that this picture, create a virtual copy, and then, <clears throat> and then we will bring the settings back to zero. Ba, 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 ba. All right, V. Okay, let's get into what I do with my images. This is a black and white image. Let's share the screen, Cardi. Let's share screen. Sorry, guys. There we go. There we go. All right. And let's bring this back to a raw, untouched photo. This is what the photo looked like out of camera. Now, Obviously, we want to nail our exposure first. Sometimes I hit the auto button just to see what Lightroom would do to my photo. So if we hit the auto button, you see Lightroom makes it, um, drops the contrast, I mean, drops the exposure, bumps the contrast, drops highlights, vibrance, blacks, bumps whites, bumps shadows. So we're gonna undo that. And I'm gonna just go through one at a time. The first thing I think that's important to do is exposure. I don't use the histogram with my exposure. I do this visually. I just by looking at the photograph, you can see up here in the histogram, as I slide my exposure one way, the histogram pushes to the dark area. As I slide my histogram to the light area, my exposure light, the histogram slides to the light area. So ideally, it shows my exposure is quite normal, um, but I'm gonna bias it a little bit darker. And it's funny enough, that's exactly what Lightroom said to do. 
As far as contrast, uh, you don't adjust contrast yet because there's other smarter ways to adjust contrast down here in the presence section. So we're gonna do that next. In the presence section, I'm gonna push up vibrance. Now vibrance is another way to adjust saturation. I'm gonna show you two ways to process this image. This is um, the first way, which is more of a quicker way. If you push up um, vibrance, you can see the image just slightly gets more saturated. If I really jack it, you can see the saturation happening. And if I really lower it, you can see that vibrance is actually a smart saturation slider. Also, texture. Texture, there's lots of texture in this photo. There's lots of texture in this photo, and you can see if I increase the texture, it brings way more detail. I'm gonna, I'm gonna raise this. It brings way more detail up in the bark of the trees. As I slide this up, it gets way more textured. And as I slide this down, it gets much less textured. So because there is some texture in the tree, I'm gonna push this up a bit, but not to an insane amount. Next, clarity is a setting that if you're using people, it's good to kind of pull the clarity down a little. If you're photographing people, that's gonna make the, the skin blend and smooth just a little bit. Whereas if you bump the clarity up, it's gonna give more definition. And that's the same with the texture tool. I wouldn't really use the texture tool for portraiture because it's going to add more texture on skin, which is gonna make skin less smooth and harder to retouch in post. So at this point here, we are going to pull the shadows. We're gonna go back up to this um, control slider here. We're gonna pull the highlights down. Gonna pull the whites. Um, actually, we're gonna push the whites up just a little bit. I am watching my histogram to make sure that I don't make any radical adjustments. I'm gonna pull the blacks down, that's too much. Right in and around here. Now, for me, compared to the original photograph, which let me just set the original photograph up right now so you can see it. Reset. Yes, exactly. So now, uh, compared to the original photograph, I haven't made much changes in this particular image. And when I do the side-by-side -side comparison, you can see that there's not much difference between these two photos. The photograph on the right is the photograph that I've made adjustments to. The photograph on the left is relatively simple. Now, from here, let's undo the compare tool. And from here, I'm going to show you now a different way to process. And also, because this is a landscape image, I, I mean, it's trees, it's a forest, we can do some cool things with radial gradient, where we can use the radial gradient and vignette by drawing circle here, pushing it in the center, there's obviously all kinds of adjustments that we can do here to pull this and give the center focus a little bit more focus. We can um, drop the exposure in the center. We can increase the exposure in the center. These are all adjustments like with the gradient. I don't typically do. And with this particular photo, this isn't a photo that I would necessarily use the gradient filter on. But you can also um, you can also use linear filters and darken just the up at the um, top of the photo. But again, that's not something that I would do per se, just because with this particular photo, um, I don't think that it needs it. Now, I'm going to re I'm going to duplicate this photo again and I'm going to show you a new technique for processing which is quite different 
And I'm going to do it on the same picture so you can see how with the same photo, but a different processing style, you can really get incredibly different photographs. Let's go, Mezumi TV. Welcome, 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 Howie. I'm glad you guys are here. All right, so here is another virtual copy. The settings we've reset to zero. I shot this in camera black and white. So at on a color photo, we come down here to our HSL color sliders. And while we're on saturation, what we do is drop all of our saturation from all of our colors down to zero to minus 100. It's not actually zero. It's all the way down. We still have a color file. So the first thing I do is that, which is take all the color out of my image. And that leaves a black and white image that I'm now able to use vibrance to adjust contrast. I'm able to use exposure to make to get my exposure proper. I'm able to use texture. And you're really able to see the image without any sort of uh, color to distract you. The next thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to add a vignette this way, which the first thing that I do with vignette is in lens correction, our lenses have a natural vignetting. And when you use your lens correction, it actually takes that vignetting away. So I put that vignetting back just by doing this slider. And you can see the lens vignetting is very, very slight. I pull the lens vignetting back. And again, I do this on certain photos. The next thing I do is post crop vignetting. I pull this in just a little bit more. Now you can see you can get quite radical with this. And I think it's important to not get too radical. But some I would say I drop this around between 10 and 20. Right there, that is at 23%. So I've done my vignetting, I've done my exposure, and now I come back here to the HSL sliders and I start bringing back in necessary colors. Now, not all colors are necessary. Watch this. First thing that we do is hit red. There's no red in the photo, so we can leave red at, at negative 100. Orange, you can see all the trees have a hint of orange. So we're gonna leave that orange in. In fact, you can increase that saturation. I'm gonna put that right to about 20. That's starting to look good. Yellow, I know there's lots of yellow in this photograph. So when we bring back yellow, you can see now that seems like it's the whole picture. We also have the option of pulling back some yellow, which makes the photo feel a little bit more neutral or accelerating and pushing the yellow past that point, which I think gets a little bit too saturated. I want to have some mood to this picture. So I'm going to drop the yellow down to about uh, minus 15, minus 12 there. Okay, green. I'm sure there's tons of green in this photo. You can see as we add green, you can see the green doesn't do that much. This is with no green and this is with green added back in. You can see it just adds a little bit of an emphasis to these leaves that it's fall time. So the leaves are changing quite a bit. And if I slide the green up, like this is oversaturating the green, it doesn't really do much. So I'm going to leave some of the green out of the picture. We're going to do this at about minus 30. Aqua, I don't believe there's any aqua in the picture. So we can leave that at zero. There's no blue in the photo, so we can leave that at zero. There's no purple in the photo, and there's no magenta in the photo. So you can see now that this photo exists orange, yellow, green, and um, there's no aqua. Yeah, it's basically orange, yellow, and green that make up this photo. Huh. Yellow. We're going to pull this yellow back just a little bit, just to add just a little bit of a different mood to this. And if I push the green up a bit, yeah, it really doesn't do anything for this photo. Let's try with orange. I'm going to push the orange 
up a bit, which adds a little bit of a mood to it. And you can see here, if we go into our um, into our curves, and again, tone curves is something that I don't really mess with tone curves enough. I feel like I could mess around with tone curves more, but I don't. Uh, I feel like I need to research a little bit more on curves. Um, I do have a, a basic understanding of them, but I want to, I, I don't make, mess around with my curves too much. And I wanted to make today about things that I do to my photos. So um, yeah, it's important that uh, I research before I give you like the curves tutorial. So I'm going to save that one for another day. Um, if you guys are genius on curves or have learned amazing things about curves, please share your sources or the knowledge that you have. So if we look now at these three photos, starting with the original photo with no manipulation, the photo that I processed um, afterwards, and you can see between these two photos, um, there's not much difference. Like it's almost, I mean, I hope the preview is updating. Let me just uh, preview, preview. Oh, it looks like the thumbnails there. Okay. And then this photo. There we go. So original, a very, very slight difference with this one. And then this photo. A and you can see they just snap into like three different levels of contrast. I like doing my images in con like I like adjusting the look and feel of my images before I start dealing with color. So the removing the black and white is a great, great tip. That's kind of a one by one, one step at a time way that I process my images. I think that I want to do it to just one more because I do have quite a few images here that I haven't uh, processed yet, but I do want to see what I can bring out of them, if that makes any sense. All right, let me find just one more. This is a photo that I haven't, this is how I envisioned it, which is a black and white image. I've never seen this picture in color. Honestly, I shot my camera on monochrome. So we are going to see it in color. You can see it's a little bit hot. You can see here it's leaning a little bit into the hot area, which is fine. Let's make a virtual copy. And then we're going to deal with the processing of this picture. All right. So the first thing, again, just reminders, the first thing that we're doing is exposure. I'm also, I want to talk to you guys a little bit about collections in a second. I just want to process one more photo. You can see I've dropped the exposure quite a bit and now the histogram looks a lot um, nicer. Next, we are going to do some vibrance. Actually, you know what we're going to do is we're going to go down here. I think this picture would be way better suited, processed in black and white with the um, color saturation sliders. So we're going to pull all the saturation. Let me just do that this way. I think it's going to snap and process better. Right now, we can see that my highlights I'm really starting to lose. So if I pull my highlights way back here, you can see I get way more of my highlights back. I'm looking specifically in this area. Shadow detail, I have lots. So I'm going to pull my shadow detail back quite a bit as well. You can see the contrast is really starting to come up there. Texture, there's quite a bit of texture. So I'm going to push the texture up in this photo. You can see the, the um, tree bark. If I push the texture way up like this, how that tree bark detail really starts to come up. I'm gonna leave that about 20. Same thing with clarity. We're gonna bump clarity up just a touch. 
And that to me is starting to feel like a photo. We're going to come down here to saturation. We're going to, oops, what am I saying? Saturation to vignetting. I'm going to do the lens vignetting and then just a touch of highlight priority vignetting. This one only needs a touch. That's about five. So from there, again, remember we come back to the saturation sliders. There is no red. There is a little orange. That's a photo there. <laughs> Just right there with a little bit of orange. It's starting to look like something. Next, we are going to add yellow. And yellow brings, I don't know, yellow brings a look in that I'm not sure that I like. I'm going to leave that yellow out. Let's bring black. I'm Oh my God, I can't talk. Let's bring green back. And you can see there's quite a bit of green. So bringing green, I'm going to push the saturation on this one a little bit more. Aqua, there's none. Blue, there's none. Purple, of course, no. And magenta, of course, no. So this photograph exists with green and orange. And I can push that orange saturation up. Wow, that's really high. I can push the green saturation up or drop the green saturation. And even th now, you can see it's a completely different feeling than the original photo, which you see here. I don't know. Like, I'm just, when you do selective desaturation, I feel like um, it really it really snaps into something that looks completely, completely unique. For me, this particular photo, I would likely use in black and white because I, I think that this is the most interesting look of this photo. Although this is a different frame, I do find, um, I do find it a little bit more compelling in black and white, but this is a cool save by the way. I noticed um, Mezumi TV mentioned my logo. You can put your logo in Lightroom. So uh, if you guys want me to make a short, because it is quite short, I will make a short to let you guys know how you do that. It's super, super easy. All right, let me just check my notes to make sure that I'm not missing anything. Um. Next, very important, something that I haven't ever really messed with, but recently it's time, and that is presets. Now, I don't use other people's presets, but creating your own presets that you can then go back in and tweak is very easy, a lot easier than I thought. This is why photographers sell Lightroom presets because it's so easy to create them. Those adjustments that I just made in Lightroom to this image, it is so absolutely simple. You can see everything that I've made here, my look where I've desaturated a certain color, my lens corrections, my vignetting. If you go up here, to edit, develop, photo. It's actually under develop. You can see, actually, let me move my top bar so you guys can see. I forgot my top bar is there. Here we go. So up on the top here, under develop, you can see it says new preset. Now on a Mac, it's shift Apple N that brings up the preset dialog and just like when you're copying and pasting your settings from photo to photo you can save them from your literally you can save the look of this photo and apply it to any one of your other photos and again you can select what you want to include in that preset name it and then start groups. You can start your own groups. Like this is for landscape. This is for portraits. This is for black and white. This is for, and really go crazy with saving looks and achieve a consistency 
between your photos. How many people are not using presets or weren't using presets before? Know that when you don't use presets, one of the reasons to use presets is it, it's consistency. If you're trying to get a look and a, a specific look to your photos, a specific feeling, think of Corey's work, think of Devon Shu's work. One of the great ways to get that look and have that on all of your photos is by using presets. Yes, you can remember every time what you do to your photos, but this streamlines and speeds up your experience. Again, very simple. You go to develop and you say new preset or on a Mac, it is shift Apple N, which brings up this dialogue and you can name it, save it, and then keep them organized so you can apply them to other photo shoots. You guys should test presets. Julie, you said that you haven't used presets. Vicky, I'm not sure if you use presets. Mezami, don't know if you use presets, but try it and see how presets work for you with your workflow. Now, another thing that I recently discovered, and I don't want to say recently because I'm so silly. I used to do this. I, I, I did this before, but for some reason along the way, I stopped using collections in Lightroom. Now, how many people watching right now, whether you're watching live or watching after the fact, how many people use collections? I'm very curious if you use collections. Now, I had not used collections before, but I mean, I had, but that was like last year. And after you undock the drives that you have in your smart collections, after a while, you're like, I just forgot. So I'm back on collections. And yesterday, I really discovered the like genius behind collections, how to quickly use them and how to make it benefit you for organizing your photos. Again, um, I I'm sorry that I'm, uh, Gregory says that he uses them when doing batch editing like event photos. Amazing. So collections, you'll see on the sidebar, of your Lightroom library, you see the drives that you've mounted, you see your catalogs, and there is a section called collection. Now I've made two collections here. It's incredibly easy to make a new collection. You simply create collection, name it whatever you like. And then now I have a new collection and it's selected a photo because I had a photo auto selected already. So the first thing I will do is remove from collection. Can I do that? Um, 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 um. Uh, yeah, here it is. Remove from collection. So this is what I was missing. And I want you guys to pick this one up. This is the genius. How you manage collections is I hit the test collection. I right click and I say set as target collection. Boom. Now it hits a plus. So there's a plus there. And now you can go back to your folders and look at your photos as you do and scan through whatever photos that you're wanting to look at. And then when you find a photo that you want to add to a collection, you simply press the letter B. Now I'm going to right click it, go down here and it says add to target collection. And then you see the shortcut that's next to it is B. Now that you know that, you can fly through your photo shoots and just hit B, add it to collection test, hit um, this picture, B, go over here, hit this photo here, B, 
And now when I go back to that collection, you can see all the images that I hit the letter B have added to that specific target collection. If you want to change to a different collection, you just right click the new collection set as target collection. And then now that's the target collection. So as you're browsing, you're able to just assemble photographs quickly and put them into a place where you could now look at them in this way. So that's genius. And one of the things that I feel like I haven't been doing and I hadn't I, I'm about to do it now. Now, I've mentioned that I would talk about keywords and this is a great genius way to use keywords. You click here and you say new smart collection and you call that smart collection portraits. Now, you also then create rules. And the rules, you can say match any of these rules or match all or match none. And um, the rating, you can literally create smart folders by rating. Any photos that are five stars, put into this smart folder. And then, of course, you share that smart folder with your client. You can also use um, metadata like keywords. And right here, now, any keyword that contains portrait, it is going to put into this gallery. Oops, let's call it portraits, plural. So anything that has the keyword portraits, and you can see it's already populating with photographs, Michael Sheen, Beanie Man, Sandra O. Oh, none of these images are docked, meaning I don't have the hard drives put in here, but this just created a smart folder instantly with all the photographs that I have keyworded portraits. So if you go back to on import, if you have a whole session and you know that that session is all portraits, now using smart collections and smart folders, all of those portraits automatically populate here into that smart folder that you labeled portraits or landscape or aerials or wildlife or lions or whatever. Now, smart folders become hyper, hyper useful when you're going into your photo shoots after the fact and you're going through item by item and you're selecting a group of photographs and you're adding your keywords here. You can batch add keywords, meaning you select a several photographs, type a keyword, enter, it applies the keyword to all of those photographs. And then of course, those photographs populate into that smart collection. So this is some stuff that I'm hoping this is helpful for you guys and no, this is using Lightroom in a way that is like you're using Lightroom to help you. You're using Lightroom to be more beneficial for you as a program rather than just the thing that you have to do in order to get your photographs to a point where you can share them. Have fun with this program. Know that Lightroom is a absolute rabbit hole and you can fall the more time you spend on this program and the more time that you spend in Lightroom actually trying to learn things that you don't know that's super key yesterday and again I was going to do this episode last week but I decided to I, I rearranged some stuff and I decided to do it this week instead and know that help on Lightroom CC is one of the top searches that my viewers have. People who are looking within the Photoshop or within the photography space are looking for help with this program. And I think for many new photographers who are just now, they went from shooting with their phone to now they have a camera and they know they have to use a program to manage those photos. They've heard of Lightroom. They don't know how to really 
make Lightroom work for them. That's why I decided to do this podcast today. I thought, and also some of my regular viewers, many of you aren't really squeezing the most out of this program and myself being one of them. So I thought that I was going to start squeezing more out of Lightroom and sharing everything that I learn along the way. And that's the whole point. I'm an older gentleman. You don't have to call me a gentleman, but I'm an older man. And know that I've had to adapt from film to Photoshop, from film to digital, from film to and being in the dark room and doing this with black and white and doing this with trays and doing this with tongs. I, I went from a very analog, manual, technical, tactical photographer to making photographs and then sitting at my desk, you know? And I really um, rebelled against digital photography when I first started back in the day. I really did. I rebelled. I rebelled against digital photography. But over time, I, I realized when I got my first digital camera in 2004, um, like there was no Lightroom back then. It was just Photoshop and raw processing in Photoshop. And I adapted. When I, once I switched to digital and at six megapixels, a digital camera looked the same as my Hasselblad in quality. At six megapixels, I shoot... 45 megapixels right now so the quality of our images right now are incredible but also with bigger resolution better cameras the programs get more and more expensive not expensive but um they get like taxing on our system is what i'm trying to say so we have to get better and better computers to keep up with the programs to keep up with the tech since I've gone digital, oh my God, the ecosystems that you have to buy into with the computer set up. And you can see here on my desk, I have laptop, dual screens, Mac mini, like the tablet, like all the stuff that we end up having to have as digital photographers. It can be overwhelming, but with just your camera, and your laptop and Lightroom, you're able to make angels sing. You're able to make the most amazing magic with your photography. We just have to put in the time. We just have to put in the effort to like do the work to learn our programs. And I think that many of us don't learn our programs enough. We don't take it we don't take it far enough, you know? And again, I'm a victim of one of those people that doesn't push what a program can do for me as far as I could. One of my resolutions for 2023, along with making AI my bitch and making AI work for me, I'm also making all the programs that I use work more efficiently for me. My website, I've recently added book now buttons. So you can go to my website, book me for headshots and pay right through the booking portal that I've recently added. My join my mailing list, the Substack. like I'm, I'm incorporating right up to YouTube and this podcast. I'm incorporating systems that have longevity that essentially, especially with the content that I'm making, the content is just out there and able to help people. That's the whole point that I do this channel. My whole YouTube channel is all about mentorship and helping you guys who find me get to the next level with your photography. That's all it's about. And also, of course, making content for you, my viewers. I Making content for me is vain which I have no interest in doing. I have no interest in making content for me. I have all the interest in making content for you. 
So how you can help me is by joining the Discord. And if you have episode ideas, if you have topics that you want me to talk about, if you have short form content that I could make just with a quick video, all you need to do is be a part of the Discord, be active and just tell me, tell us what you'd like to see more of that helps me more than you could possibly know. All right, I think we're gonna wrap up the Lightroom talk. There is not, uh, I mean, one more thing that I can touch on is how I share my images with my clients. And I think that that's important. How I share my client with my clients is simple. I do a first pass of all my images. And on the first pass, I'm going to find a client folder right now. On the first pass, what I do is take away all the blinks, anything that is is what we would define as a bad photo. When I'm shooting in the studio, if the flash didn't go off or anything like that, if a picture's out of focus, framed incorrectly, I take those all away. And how I do that is by using um, the rating system one through five. You simply push the number one and you can see it puts a one on this photo. Now, the next thing that is kind of secret time is, and I'm gonna show you, this is a really small trick, but it is going to make it so your editing and first pass, your culling process is so much faster. Right here, photo, auto advance. Okay, now I haven't selected auto advance. Watch what happens when I click this and I'm here and I select one, nothing happens, right? Now I'm gonna oh, go back and unselect that to zero. I'm gonna go back here, I'm gonna unselect that to zero simply by pushing zero, which makes it now rated zero. One through five, rates one through five. For me, a one is uh, something that I'm now taking away. So if I select this one, go one, 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 and then say, show me rated, it's only gonna show me the once because I haven't rated any other photo. Now these photos are duds because I rate one, blinks, blah, blah, blah. So now I can see all of my ones and I can pull them from my library, delete them from my card. Now, um, Bear is saying auto advance is the thing, obviously. Auto advance. Now, I have no photos. <gasps> I've deleted them all. Auto advance now filters off when we're on photo and auto advance uh, everybody might know this but some person one person might not know this and it's helped one person amazing now with auto advance when you click the rating system it auto it auto goes to the next so now you're able to just fly through your photos and rate them and it's it's taking the radar and automatically doing that next button for you. Obviously, you can still use the forward back buttons, but the fact that it does the auto advance for you makes culling so, so, so much easier, faster, better. Now we are going to remove the zeros off of all of these photos. Um, all right, because these are all good. Next, the next thing that you can do to speed up your editing is by using stacks. And what stacks does is it takes your photos and basically arranges them in the time that you took them. So if I right click and go down here, it says stacking group into stack. You can also auto stack by capture time. And what that means is like group pictures that I shot within five seconds of each other, group pictures that I shot within three seconds of each other, within 10 seconds of each other. And then what that ends up doing is it takes this photo here, which is primarily the same pose and stacks them into one photo. So you now can look at that photo, 
group into stack. And now you can look at that photo, choose your favorite one, and then collapse it back into a stack. So instead of picking or looking at all of these photos, we know these photos, that's one. So you go through here, find the six, pick the best one. Go to the next, here to here, make a stack, pick the best one. Go here, oops, here to here. These are all, well, these two and these two are different because of the red variation, but you could just make stacks and now your insane amount of 1200 photos are now narrowed down into little groups of photos, which make it much easier for you to choose your favorite one. How I shoot is by, um, I shoot through the picture. So you'll see several photos of the same image with slight variations because I'm looking for the perfect, perfect. And once I get it, I make my change. I shoot several pictures of the same with slight variations. I grab my picture. So using stacks with my style of shooting is very, very effective for narrowing down your ideas into single bursts of photographs. So that's another tip. The last thing I was going to talk about is how I share with my clients. I use Google Drive. Now there's many different ways and I'm interested right now. This is what I'm actively looking for. I'm actively looking for the best way to share my photos with clients now that I'm using Lightroom really uh, intensely. I'm very, I'm also going to be deep diving into um, Capture One because I think Capture One has some a better share with client options than Lightroom. So, and different processing algorithms and stuff like that. So I'm very interested in what like and what um Capture One has to offer. But now I do this. I select all. When I share with my clients, I come down here and I export photos. It obviously is going to bring up this dialog box. When I'm exporting for my clients, there is no way that I'm going to share high res retouched photos. So this is where presets come in. My presets are not showing up for some reason. Cancel. Um, so this is where uh, you can make presets for your export. Imagine I want to export for Google Drive. I by the way, this is how I resize my images for sharing on Discord. 4,000 wide by empty, which will then make whatever the width, it'll make the height proportionate to whatever the width is. So never, I only put one um, constraint and then by pixels, 100 DPI. So this is how I export for perfect size, but also under the eight megabyte limit on Discord. That is secret time, how I do it. Next, I make sure that the metadata is in there because I want the metadata baked into my photo. Um, and then I watermark. When I'm sharing photos for clients, it's important to watermark them. So this is where, oh my God, all of my metadata is gone, including my watermark. Very weird. And all my presets. <laughs> Very strange. <laughs> I have to figure that out. But basically, this is where you add your watermark. And then on export, I export it directly into a Google Drive folder that I share with my client. What I'm looking for in the future, and I think that this is something that some of you may have on lock or already have how to do this. But what I'm looking for now or next is a way for me to have my clients be able to look at my photos online, rate them and have the ratings come right into Lightroom. So when they make their picks, their picks literally coincide completely with what I'm looking at here. 
I know Capture One does that. And imagine Capture One has Capture One live. So Capture One, you're shooting tethered. Your images are coming into your computer live. Your client is remote. They are hundreds of miles away looking at their computer and live as you're shooting, the images pop up. The other thing that Capture One allows you to do is if you have presets or looks or um, LUTs or whatever, like it will put that look. If you, basically you can adjust exposure, contrast your look for one photo, and then all the photos afterwards come into the program with that LUT, with that look preset on it already. So your clients at the client side live are seeing a more finished photo than what I could give them when I tether using the Canon utility and Lightroom. Next, your client can then rate those photos, select favorites as they're coming in, and those ratings live update on your desk in Lightroom. So, I mean, in Capture One. So that that's kind of next level for me. And then that gallery becomes the website for the client to continue to look at after the shoot is over. And as they make their ratings, make their favorites, make their selections, when you open Capture One, they just populate. So <clears throat> I'm very interested in Capture One. And right now, Capture One, much like the battle between DaVinci Resolve, Final Cut, and Premiere are like all neck and neck. Right now, the runaway winner is DaVinci Resolve. And I don't use DaVinci, but more and more creators are, you, are switching from Final Cut and Premiere to DaVinci because it just, it thinks differently. And it's just like Apple and Apple's... Um, moniker always was think different. DaVinci Resolve as a program was a colorist's program. They used just for color correction and um, color like tone and look and feel for polish. But DaVinci is a full editing program and now people are doing their whole edits in DaVinci. So Capture One is something that if you guys are interested in me doing a deep dive on Capture One and learning a little bit more about that program so I could share it with you, please leave comments, leave um, comments in chat and comments in this video because I'm interested in seeing what Capture One has to offer. Also, if you're interested in knowing how to add an identity bar because you made it this far in this video, it is called an identity plate. And it is super simple to set up. You click identity plate setup. You drag your identity plate right to this spot. You hit click OK. And then it looks like this. Secret time, because you guys are dedicated G's for watching this video, it took me some time to figure out the size that you need to make your identity plate because that it doesn't tell you because you guys have made it to this part of the video. I'm going to tell you, make your identity plate 41 pixels high for one, 41 pixels high by 500 pixels wide. If you make your identity plate 41 high by 500 wide and then drop your logos and stuff in there, you can make your logo a PNG, so it's transparent, which I suggest. So transparent PNG, always gonna be the best quality if you bring it from Illustrator. Illustrator gives you higher quality, non-rasterized text. If you don't know what rasterizing is, by the way, if you guys are trying to incorporate text with your photos, you need to use Illustrator. Illustrator, you can type text that is this small and then select it and expand and make it infinite size and all of your curved lines are completely smooth. Photoshop, which is not a text program, although it allows you to use text, whatever size you type your text, if you stretch it or even look at it closely and look at the curved lines, the lines are all rasterized, meaning 
angle, 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 angle. So a curved line looks like little jaggeds, like a JPEG. That's because Photoshop is not optimized for text. InDesign and Illustrator are optimized and create raster-free text. Um, create your text in Illustrator, copy and paste. You can copy text from Illustrator, paste it into Photoshop and get raster-free text. You can copy between your programs. Little bit of free information for y'all. Guys, I hope you found that little bit of Lightroom love helpful. Do let me know if you like these Lightroom deep dives. If you do, I will make more. I want to make one on culling, like a true culling masterclass, like how to choose your best photo. Um, many people miss their their best photos in the like in the Lightroom like it, your photos right here, but they miss it. So I'm going to try to help you guys cull better um, by doing three passes. I have a very specific way that I look at my photographs so I don't miss any. If you guys are interested in me making a video on culling or interested in me making more videos like this specifically on um, post-processing, Lightroom, tethering, that kind of stuff. Let me know and I'll start making them. Um, all right. Do you guys want me to look at some photos? Um, here's another thing that I've been thinking about because you can see right now we have a tight hour. Right now, in a perfect world, the episode ends and it's just Oki. Let's go. Welcome. Thank you for hanging out with us. And by the way, thank you for the $5 donation during the last episode. I did not have my alerts on for some reason, and um, I missed your donation. So thank you. Culling would be helpful. That's all you need to know. That could very much be um, one of the next videos that I make. Um, by the way, guys, this is just another sidebar. I like sidebars today. Sign up for Square. Sign up for Square and sign up for um, Stripe. There are two free programs that you can that give you all kinds of tools to be able to take credit card payment, to be able to take tap, visa math, like just to be able to take online payments. If you're with Squarespace, you may have the ability to take online payments already. Many of my viewers use Adobe Portfolio. I recommend Adobe Portfolio to everybody. Hi, Bear Thunder. By the way, I saw your messages. I was talking. Hello, Bear. Thank you for hanging out. Um, sign up for Square, sign up for Stripe, and I'll show you how I'm using it just quickly here on my website. If you go to Headshots and scroll down, you will see Book Now. You will see book now. You will see book now. Message for corporate headshot bookings. So book now. And where it takes you is my online booking website, which studio sessions, package one, package two, package three, low hate location headshots, one, two, three, book location headshots, package one, you say yes, it selects, continue, gives you my location, select, pick a date, a time, and pay. And I get an email, this person wants to shoot with you, they want to shoot with you at such and such a time, they've paid already, and it is wham, bam, thank you, ma'am. If you use Square or Stripe, guess what? The money goes into your bank account the next business day. It is super fast, it's super streamlined, and being able to have a list of some of my services here and a good description as to what you're going to get in an easy way straight from my website to book it, genius. I've been doing this already with my one-on-one um, -on -one consulting. And by the way, um, secret time for a limited time. 
a very limited time. I have discounted my one-on-one -on -one intensive training that I do online. Um, it's basically what you're experiencing right now, but just for you, I make a video, you get the video. I do photo critiques, reviews, like I help you with your portfolio. Like it's basically super intense. I just recently did this with, um, Danny Santa Anna. Danny's taken a workshop with me in the past and this, it's just super, super helpful. I've lowered the price by $50 here. This is now $200 for two hours. I've also lowered the price of my one hour portfolio review, which is now $100. It is super intensive. I am definitely, um, I like to think very good at this. It's, it happens super quickly. I'm able to really give you a full on assessment of where your work is and how you can get it to the next level. Quick, look, I'm wearing the same hoodie as in this screenshot. That's funny. So this is where I first added the buy now or book now button. So you can see you click there. It still brings you to this section. So I have all, I'm looking for a way that each button is specific for the thing that you think that you're going to buy. But in the meantime, until that is sorted, I have like my own little micro site that works on mobile that people can look at all the different services that they can book. And essentially they might have thought that they were trying to book me for um, location headshots package one, but they might end up being here and changing their mind and booking a bigger package. You can also add a tip at point of booking, you can add discounts and all this different stuff. So it's super smart for you guys. This I'm using Square for this and it's super, super tight. I suggest you guys get on it. I um, think that that was the last little bit of housekeeping that I wanted to show you guys. Um, yeah, Julie says she didn't have any luck adding it to her website yet, but she's gonna research that again. Good deal, good deal. Not sure if you guys noticed, but hey, look, your chat's right there. So um, the more chat messages that happen, the more active it is over there. You might see yourself typing right there. Look at that. Oh, it's your time. It is your time. Let's look to make sure we even have some photo reviews. We do. Let's go. Guys, it is your favorite time. Your favorite time, baby. It is time for real photo reviews. And I gotta tell you, the reason it just got so smoky in here is because my viewers drop smoke. The people who watch this show, the people who submit, um, I swear to God, they're the most talented people on YouTube. The people who watch, um, the photographers, um, the level of progression that happens in this discord, um, through this program, it, it's humbling because it's not my work. I'm just critiquing and giving my tips, but seeing what you guys do with my tips and how you progress and how fast that's happening is kind of mind blowing. So for me, um, yeah, you guys deserve the smoke. I don't know if I give you guys accolades enough with how talented you guys are, but um, if you haven't submitted photos, don't be intimidated to submit because the talent level is so high. Don't be. Know that everybody with their camera starts from scratch. Everybody starts from the same spot. Um, it's a talent thing. It's a perseverance thing. It's a dedication thing and um, you truly can't stop making photos. You get better every time you shoot. All right. We have submissions from Turtle, from Sam McRae, from Bear Thunder. That is what we are looking at today. All righty. Let's get into photos from Turtle. This photographer, Josh McCoy, and his progression, and uh, Josh Josh is watching. Josh helps me also after the fact. I'm sure you guys noticed that 
Um, I have chapter markers on my podcast now. Josh has been helping me add chapter markers to new podcasts, to older podcasts. I've been doing some myself. Josh has been doing many of them. So Josh helps so much. Um, Behind the Picture Magazine, um, I, I kind of got a little crazy this month, but I'm right now wanting to start it, Josh. And I think that you're going to be a great person to help me get that off the ground. Josh's photography here. This is so good. I almost don't want to show you. I almost don't want to show you. Josh, this is so good. Josh's first photograph. Let's get it on. Guys, what do you think of this photograph here? So, so absolutely crazy. The depth, Josh, you have this cross composition on lock. I want you to see his composition and how Josh just has the cross composition on lock. You like, Josh, I want you to hear me. This is one of your best drone photographs for so many reasons. It is really, really, really good. Really good. This is three reallys good. Three reallys. Like, I'm floored by the level of quality here. And also look at these big photos that Josh is submitting. You know, I'm able to scroll around. It makes it really easy for me to look at fine details. It really makes it easy for me to check shadow detail. And it proves to you that you can do this. You can upload big images that are small on the Discord. Also, I want you to notice how Josh is using selective processing and selective colors in order to um, really desaturate certain areas. Josh, when you look at this photo up close and you look at, at like when you see it like this, here's my suggestion. Because you're doing that technique that I taught you with, um, with selective contrast, I mean selective um, saturation, adjusting your contrast and bringing colors in when you get into a scenario like this where you have a color that you want to remove try not to go all the way to minus a uh, 100 try not to go to minus 100 because what ends up happening is we get gray and that's kind of, I think, what we're trying to avoid. And again, this is something that I'm learning as I work through this technique. Imagine rather than going minus 100, go like minus 90, go like minus 85. Like, see, so there's just a hint of tone in here. Now, I have to tell you, when you look at the whole photo, it's like, Wow, it really feels like high impact, but I don't want you to be revealing the trick. Do you know what I mean? I don't want you to reveal the trick so blatantly. So pull that saturation way back, but maybe not all the way on elements because this is a color whatever color you're pulling out it's a color that exists in this photograph right so thank you alice for being here by the way thank you um enjoy the rest of your day know that the photograph the color that you're taking out of this photograph that color that you're stripping just don't strip it all the way strip it to 90. so there's a hint of it in the shadows there's a hint of it down here and then when you look at this it's still going to have the same feeling but people won't know why they won't know that you're select if you look at this you can just say okay yes he's selectively removing color you want that to be a bit more of a myth and then also the colors that are existing you can now play with how far you push these the yellows like how far up you you play with these and again as you work through these save presets save presets and see 
um, go back and be like, okay, you know what? I actually, it works when I take this color out all the time. It doesn't matter what I'm shooting. I'm applying this specific preset with like green at like 90 minus 90 and yellow bumped up. Like you're shooting with this preset all the time and seeing what that looks like. Again, it's just the suggestion. Um, this picture blew me away. I, I, I want to make it clear. This photo blew me away. It's unequivocally an 11 out of 12. I mean, an 11 out of 10. I'm just fucking with you. Yeah, it's definitely 11. This is really great. First photograph from Josh. All right. Next photo from Josh. It's a little bit more of a detail punch in on that um, other one. Um, by the way, guys, you can see I have two camera frames. I have this one, um, which is like what I've used. But today, you can see I'm also I'm testing this. So do let me know um, if you like this new idea for when I'm reviewing photographs. I'm just trying to do something a little bit different. All right, Josh, this is a great shot. I love the offset. I love the offset. It super works. Let's look at it as a cover. Um, really strong as a cover. Um, I, I have no real issues with this photo. The contrast feels a little flat. I, I feel like it's flat just because maybe some texture, you could bump some texture. Oops, that's not what we're trying to do. You could bump some texture up. Let's hide. Um, <laughs> how did that get all the way over there? That's crazy. My button slided around. Yeah, you can add some texture, which is going to give you detail in here. And that detail, like we have here with the contrast lines, I mean, the shadow lines, because over here it's hitting kind of flat. The adding some texture is gonna be great. The time of day that you shot is like 100% great. This directional long shadow light is amazing. These patches are great. Like again, Josh, this is a fantastic photo. Um, you get better every time you shoot, dude. This is just another one that's just another banger. Really strong, really strong. All right, let's look at another one from Josh, yeah? All right, all right, all right, all right. You keep reminding me that you can only go 400 feet with this drone, and um, I keep thinking that you can go higher. This is a cool angle. Is it my favorite from what you've shared today? No, because you came hard with like the heavy hitters. This is a bit claustrophobic for me, but I also know that the horizon line is right here and you're creatively cutting the horizon line, which makes it kind of difficult. These sweeping lines I'm really interested in. I think that they look super cool. The train, um, like patches of water I, it's an interesting photograph to look at i just feel like you have some stuff that's just so profound this is a little busy um but maybe in black and white this photograph might be stronger in composition i'm not really it's not grabbing me right now for some reason. I'm not going to spend too much time on it, Josh. You, you create so much amazing content. And again, if you're looking at a photograph like this, and uh, we just take a pause and some silence, and then looking at a photograph like this, for me, it's not, it doesn't have the same balls to it. And I hope you, I hope you guys agree. Let's look at another, shall we? All right, all right, all right, all right. I think it has to do with how busy you make your frames because this now is a frame that you've kept super minimal. Again, with the cross composition, you can see the discipline of his composition and how his lines and how things of interest like this, like this here, um, push you like this buried road which I just noticed the fact that this is a road that goes into water and what's over here buried. And is this flood zone? Is this a flood, dude? Like what is happening? Now I'm actually taking in this photo that it's a flood. 
and how look at the water just growing onto this land like this is insane and this is clearly trees that are absolutely dying because they're being um because they're drowning look at all these drowning trees so sad this is crazy <laughs> this is really crazy um and again this is one of your better ones. This is really strong, really strong. Um, for me, it is in the same neighborhood. And if you look at the composition, you can see that this is shot by the same photographer. Really great job, really great job. And again, this like the desaturation um, idea you're also doing it sometimes but not all the time like there has to be like this sweet spot of a treatment that you're able to um, apply maybe to all your photos we'll see all right let's look at another shall we fuck i keep forgetting to do that all right one more wow i don't even know what i'm looking at here turtle what is this what is this are those pens? Are those cows? Those are cows. That's insane. 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 Again, with the cross composition, you can see the discipline with my man and how he shoots. That's a really straight line, Cardi. Some of your best work. How he shoots this way. It's just really strong. It's just really strong. The grass, super groomed grass up here. And this is insane. Like you just want to know what that is. And the fact that it's cows is insane. This is another absolute banger. And again, just looking at, tell me that this photo, this photo, and this photo aren't shot by the same photographer. Like, look at that. Like. This is what I'm so proud of you for is your visual signature. You're making such strides with your visual signature, Josh, like how you shoot with the drone, how you're seeing photographs that way are really, it's really developing. You should be really happy, dude. Like really, really happy. You have um, from this set, there are, I would say three photos that will end up in your um, website and portfolio. And that is this, this, and um, this. These three photos for sure should be on your website. Not sure about this one. I don't think it would make it. And this one is a, a detail of this photo. And this photo is just so much more immense and powerful. This isn't, I don't think, enough, especially when you compare it to this photo. So of that set, that's three photos that carry on and end up in your aerial portfolio. You should be very happy. Those are photographs from Turtle, everybody. Let's go. All right, let's go, Turtle. Proud of you guys, proud of everybody who takes the time to submit and push their images to the next level. That that deserves accolades, yeah? All right, my friend Sam McRae, all the way from BC, they say, look at this landscape from Sam McRae. This is gorgeous. I think most effective if I hide my camera. Let's take in this wonder really really strong i feel you might be able to save some of the highlights here sam in your exposure i feel like you might i i mean you you have shadow detail there man like i i don't know what i'm saying i might be just drunk you have detail in the highlights it's white 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 i'm wondering if you can bring more sky color out i'm wondering if there's a way you can bring um a little bit more depth um in color here and in tone just to give even more contrast between the sky and the mounties 
possibly a little texture just to bring i mean again a little to bring a little bit more of the detail out in the trees the direction of the sun is really strong this is one of those photos sam that is just a winner by the way it's a winner i i, I can't complain about this at all i mean wow you did a great job this is fantastic really fantastic amazing all right so let's get into another one from sam mccray all right let me just try one thing here hey it did do that all right but is it doing the thing it's supposed to do I do not believe it is. Maybe it is. Sorry, let's see. Hey, you see how um, chat just talked to you and said vertical backtrack saved. Thank you. Sorry, give me uno momento. We are about to look at Sam's second photo. Sam, stand by. I am checking for, yeah, interesting, not doing it okay that's good to know all right let's look at sam's second sam says this by the way um new photos from days ago i think i prefer the wider shot is what his comments are this is sam's second and last photograph sam says i think i prefer the wider shot this being his second photograph here I think I agree, although I do see the power in this photograph, Sam. I definitely see the energy that you're talking about here. Um, what I really love about this photograph is the texture that's happening in here. And what I was first kind of complaining about, which is details in the highlights, at closer inspection, Sam, you have amazing <laughs> details in the highlights. And it's so nuanced that you really, really need to look at it. I think that you you nailed this very exp like um a very like complicated exposure. Like the brightness here while maintaining the shadow detail the shadow detail in here. I feel like this is one of those images that I would love to process, that I would love to make a video on processing these two photos. I think that I would have great fun trying to bring out more from these photos. Um, I'm imagining you shot these digitally and not with your four by five. They do feel um, like they're from your digital camera. Um, again, two pictures that I'd be interested in seeing submitted um, for raw processing. I would rate this number one and this number two. The thing that I really like about the second photo, Sam, is how you basically used a higher, um, you used a higher horizon line and less sky and made um, more this the main focus of your photo where your second photo is more um, it's more sky I mean you did use a good rule of thirds but I feel I, I'm very interested in what's happening down here and you give it to us you give it to us in this photo and what's down here is actually quite interesting so you could easily um like share even more of that image that's a great job that's a really really great job really great job from sam let's go all right and lastly the man about the sand this next viewer Bear Thunder has been working on shooting these level of like microscope level macros. He's been working on shooting this body of work for over two years. And Bear now has this work 
at a level where he's photographing grains of sand from all over the world. And this particular project I'm hoping ends up being a coffee table book. This is the first photograph submitted from the photographer we call Bear Thunder, Tobjorn Pettersen. It's hard for me to say I'm Canadian. Um, all right. This is Nico Harbor from Antarctica. Grains of sand. And look at how these grains of sand vary in color and tone. And look at the level of detail and sharpness that Bear Thunder is achieving for something that is smaller than one millimeter like the width of this it's insane so so great and not only that but look at the files that bear shares with us again bear thunder is another demonstration that yes you can share incredibly high quality high res photographs that still are smaller than eight megabytes and you can see also how amazing it is to be able to zoom into this work at this level. How much amazingness I actually can see, the detail that you can see, knowing that these are focus stacked images. He shoots these images using several frames. Very, very, very incredible bear, very incredible. I really love the difference of the tones with this one that looks almost like citrine with the like the color and how it fades and this looking like quartz it's like super super clear um and just you know this which looks like uh, amber and this also kind of looks like that like it's very very cool and the fact that it's sand from antarctica is really next level all right let's look at bears second and last photo and oh my god <laughs> Oh my God, Bear, like the photography is so beautiful to look at, like just gorgeous. This again is your millimeter. This is from Emerald Creek, Fernwood, Idaho. Look at this photography. Look at this piece of sand that he's selected lit and so beautifully arranged for us to look at like how are you lighting something that is smaller than a millimeter look at the shape of this perfect stop sign piece of sand it's a perfect hexagon <laughs> amazing like bare like everything from the arrangement to the placement to the direction like how these pieces are sitting this is outstanding like absolute absolute fire absolute fire and i hate to pick and play favorites between an image like this that i love so much but this is mental so 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 good so good and again, it's all about my branding. It matches my magenta sentiment. I really, really, really like it. Guys, I hope you guys appreciated this episode and I hope you guys get benefit from my photo reviews and the content that we are talking about today. I do this show Tuesday, Thursday, and Sunday is Ask a Photo. No, what? Uh, 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 I, I, I think I'm having a stroke. Tuesday, Thursday is Ask a Photo Pro. Sunday's behind the picture. I do photo reviews usually every episode. I'm trying to target the photo reviews possibly for one day a week. If I did my photo reviews only on one of my days, possibly Thursday's show is photo reviews, then Tuesday's show could be a little tighter. Sunday show could be a little tighter and then a little bit more watchable. So um, let me know. 
um, in the comments of this video about what your thoughts are about how I format my shows. Again, we are at that point right now where I'm almost at 3000 watch hours. I'm getting very close to 2800 watch hours. I'm in my last third almost. Uh, literally since January, I've got probably a thousand watch hours. I'm getting about uh, almost 500 watch hours a month. So I'm very close to monetizing. We're, we're, we're getting there. We should be there hopefully by May, June. Um, you guys can help by watching my content, but you also can help by letting me know what you'd love to see next. Like letting me know what you'd like to see me do an episode on helps me more than you could possibly know. As I mentioned earlier, for everybody who's a subscriber, thank you. Um, subscribing is a metric that helps me know that like I'm doing okay and people want to see more of my content. Um, watching my videos all the way through <laughs> is another thing, but if people aren't, I know that it's something that I'm doing wrong. So I'm doing my best to make my video content as interesting and as informative and helpful as my podcasts hopefully are. You guys can follow me on Instagram. You can follow me um, on my Substack. My Substack is called A Life Behind the Camera. And if you do not know what Substack is, you might need to want you might want to dive into one of my past episodes talking about the best blogging platform for photographers because Substack is unequivocally it. I post there every Saturday. Everybody who watched today, thank you. Everybody who submitted today, thank you. Please don't forget you guys get better every single time you look through that little window. I am here to help coach, mentor, inspire, and answer any questions that you guys have about photography and helping you get to the next level. We will see you guys on the next episode. Thank you so, so very much for watching. We'll see you guys soon.